Okay, let's take a look at one of the most amazing areas of um, Jewish medical ethics, which is relevant to everyone, really, try to show you the halachic fascination of this area, and that is the question of having to kill somebody in order to save somebody, right? Would you ever have to kill someone to save someone? And the scenario that I'm thinking of is Siamese twins, right, where you have children who are fused, where the bodies are fused, in such a way that if you, if you took the life of one, you might save one. In other words, a scenario where they're both going to die. If nothing is done, they will, they'll both die. But if you operate and separate them, killing one, you might save one. Okay, that's a very rare situation. I, in my years of medical practice, have never seen anything like that. But the reason that we study it is because it is a key to understanding many halachic issues that apply throughout medicine and well, and well beyond. So let's take a look at that subject. And what I'd like to share with you is the analysis of a case that happened a few years ago in the United States in, in New Jersey, a Jewish family that gave birth to two little girls whose bodies were fused, right? So-called conjoined or Siamese twins. And they presented exactly such a dilemma. How was that approached Jewishly? What are the principles that we, that we learned from this case? But let me just say a word or two about, about Siamese twins in general. So you know, that, you know that you have two different types of twin, right? You have twins that are so-called fraternal twins, where a pregnancy, two pregnancies develop at the same time, right? Any, any twins here? Any twins? Yeah. Identical or not? <laughs> Identical? Where's your other puff? He's where? Ah, uh, right, okay. So you have two sets. One type of twinning is where you have two pregnancies developing. In England a few months ago, a woman gave birth to two children, one white and one black. Okay, think about that. So you can have two pregnancies develop at the same time. However, however, sometimes what you get is one conception, and at an early stage of cell development, right, you have two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two cells, you get a cleavage of that embryo into two identical twins, right? They share, obviously, they're both boys, both girls, genetic features, uh, uh, appearance the same, genetic features the same, you can transplant organs from one to the other with no rejection problems, and that is known as identical twinning. When, actually for everyone, when that early ball of cells splits into two genetically identical halves, are they identical or are they mirror images? A mirror image is like right and left hands, right? You cannot superimpose them on each other. They only work as mirror images. Are identical twins the same or are they mirror images? After all, they split that way. Yeah. Now listen, listen, listen carefully. Before you answer the question, you should accuse me of asking an invalid question. What's wrong with my question? Let's think. Come on, let's learn to think together. What's wrong with my question? <laughs> Jewishly, Jewishly, you may never ask a question that makes no difference in practice, okay? That means in the world of academics, we ask questions that are academically interesting. In Jewish study, there has to be a practical difference or the Talmud would not discuss it. But I didn't ask you that question for no reason. There's a massive practical difference. What's the practical difference if identical twins are mirror images or identical? Come on, think. The difference is this. If they're identical, they will be the same, right? If they mirror images, one will have his organs where they should be, and one will have his organs reversed. The one will have his heart on the right side, and organs reversed. Because, can you see that? I have my heart on my left, but if I'm split from my twin this way, his heart will be on the right. That's very important when you're a surgeon. When you cut someone here to look for the appendix and it turns out to be here, you're in big trouble. <laughs> so your homework question is, do identical twins have a higher incidence of situs inversus? In other words, reversed organs in one of the twins. Absolutely amazing question. Ask your anatomy professor. Right? And you can really embarrass them because they won't know. But that is, the, that is the question. So that's one of the questions. And, um, but sometimes what happens is that, at least this is one of the theories, as they separate, they do not disjoin completely. And the bodies remain fused at some or other point of the anatomy. And then you get what is known as conjoined or Siamese twins. Right? For example, you have two American women, black women, who are about in their, I think in about their 40s, who are joined by the tops of their heads. Okay? The skulls are fused. They spend 40 years walking around like this. They sleep in two beds head to head. They shower together. They date together. Wow. And they are very well adjusted. One is a country and western singer and one is a nurse. Mm -hmm. They were interviewed recently. One of them said she dreamed she was separated from a sister and she felt very lonely. Right? So that's very well adjusted. But sometimes you have situations, for example, there are two <coughs> Rus Russian women who are joined from the hips down. In other words, there's one pelvis and set of legs and two bodies from the waist up. Okay, they walk perfectly coordinated on one pair of legs, although each brain controls one side. 
they do not get on well. One is a chronic alcoholic and her sister has liver disease. Because when she drinks, the sister gets drunk. Right? And they, they come to blows. Unfortunately, nothing can be done. By the way, that raises amazing halachic and moral questions. For example, if one of those girls would marry, do you see the problem? If one of them would marry, first question, is the man marrying them guilty of marrying two sisters, not allowed in Judaism? Two, in the intimate aspect of marriage, in Jewish marital law, intimacy in marriage has to be extremely private. You know, in the Orthodox world, you'll see people don't even hold hands or embrace each other in public, right? Although the intimate aspect of marriage in Judaism has to be very dynamic, but completely private. Well, in this case, you're not allowed to be intimate with one's wife when there's someone else present. In this case, the man would marry one of those girls. He would never actually be alone with his wife because, like, her sister would always be hanging on. You know, she, she, she'd been there, right? So that would be a problem. And more interesting and more deep, there's only one lower body. So in the intimate aspect of marriage, would there be adulterous element to the relationship? Do you understand? Because in that part of the body are two women. Did you see the question? So they're very, very amazing questions. And all of these have been thought through halakhically and uh, some of them been tested legally. And uh, if you'd like to see, actually, the two American girls must be about 18 or 19 now, the Hensley twins. You can actually, they've allowed themselves to be videoed through a day of their activities. They have one body from the chest down and two necks and heads. So you can see them, how they comb each other's hair. One sleeps when one's awake. One's eating while one's sleeping. Each brain controls one side of the body. They clap perfectly. They can walk perfectly. They balance on a bicycle even though each brain is controlling half the body. They recently took their driver's test in Minnesota and they were required to take two driver's tests because each brain is controlling one hand. Right? So and they drive their car. There's two people driving the car and yet they control the car perfectly. Right? So you can see all these. I saw a case in England a few months ago, two little four-year-old boys whose heads are fused at the side. Each child can see out of his eyes and each child, he can see out of his brother's eyes too. Oh. Right? Each boy can see out of his own eyes but the brains are cross-wired. So he can see out of his brother's eyes and out of his own eyes. But one of the problems, right, one of the problems is sometimes you have, by the way, the twins are usually very emotionally close to each other. For example, where I live now in London, at Great Ormond Street, is one of the largest series of separations of Siamese twins that have been done in the world. The surgeons there, very famous surgeon, one, in the best, one of the best in the world, he's a South African, of course. Um, <laughs> he told us that many years ago they discovered that when they separate twins like this, the kids get very distressed unless they nurse them in the same crib. And if one child dies, unfortunately, they found many years ago that if they nurse the surviving twin in a crib with a mirror, it helps the child settle. That's interesting, right? So they're unusual, unusual closeness to each other. But um, one of the problems is this. Sometimes the bodies are fused in such a way that they share organs. And in the case I'm thinking of that took place in 1978 or 79, these two little girls were born in a, to, to an Orthodox Jewish family in the eastern United States, small town in, in uh, New Jersey. And what happened was their bodies were fused. And the first doctor to examine them was struck to find that he could hear only one heartbeat. And what turned out to be the case was they had normal limbs and normal bodies, but their livers were fused. And that was not a surgical problem. There was enough liver tissue that could be cut to give each child enough liver tissue. But the heart was fused. So instead of being eight chambers, you know, the normal, the four chambers to the normal human heart. There should have been eight chambers to this heart, but there were only six. It was an abnormally fused heart located more in the chest cavity of baby girl B. They were not in the press then as baby girl A and baby girl B. And the heart was more in her chest. If you'd like to look this up, there was a Pulitzer Prize winning analysis of this published in the Philadelphia Inquirer. They did a famous uh, analysis of this case with f uh, pictures and interviews. Very, very well done by a non-Jewish reporter who got the Jewish stuff very, very, very well. And um, you, can, you can look that up. But what happened was the children were flown from where they were born to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, known as CHOP, right? Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I actually had the honor of giving a talk on this case in that hospital to some of the doctors who'd been involved and some of the Muslim and Christian tap chaplains who'd been involved in this case as well. And I'll tell you what they said about the case. Amazing, amazing to see the, the, the different approaches to this case. But what happened was the children were flown there and they were examined and put under the care of Dr. Elliot Koop. Dr. Elliot Koop was a famous American doctor. He became the Surgeon General of the United States. He died only about a year ago. And he's very famous, among other things, he happened to be a very religious Protestant Christian. He was the kind of man who used to spend the entire night in the hospital reading the Bible before surgery the next day to prepare himself for surgery. So you have a very Orthodox Jewish family, a Protestant Christian surgeon, 
Children's Hospital is a Catholic institution, and the case was heard in the High Court in the United States. And I'll tell you what the court case was about, but it's an amazing opportunity to see how these different legal and ethical and religious systems look at the same problem. And here's what happened. Dr. Coop examined the children, and he said to the parents, if we do nothing, both your twins are going to die. Right? The reason is that although the heart was good enough to keep the circulation of both twins going, as they began to grow, the heart would begin to fail. Right? In medicine, that's known as high output failure. The heart cannot keep up the circulation of two growing twins. In fact, on the 21st day of their lives, they went into heart failure, and they needed to be put into intensive care. And it was very clear that within two or three weeks, they both would have died. In fact, in Col Colombia, in South America, two years before, two twins like this had died. And the surgeons in Philadelphia had the heart flown up to the United States. They preserved heart in a bottle, flown up so that they could study what was likely to be the abnormal anatomy they might find if they operated on these twins. So it was very clear that if nothing were done, the twins would die. So Dr. Coop said to the parents, if we do nothing, both these girls are going to die. Let me try to save one. And what he proposed was separating the livers, tying off the major vessels of baby girl A during surgery, which means with his own hands he would kill her. He would then carry her body over to a sterile surgical table that they would have ready in the operating room. And then he would use her ribs to graft closure of the chest of baby girl B. Do you understand? In other words, where she was now missing a patch of tissue, he would take a patch of chest wall from the sacrificed twin and stick, stitch it in to close the gap and leave the entire heart in the chest of baby girl B and hopefully that would be enough to keep her alive. Now you can imagine what an agonizing decision this is. By the way, by the way, why was he talking about killing baby girl A? I can think of at least four better options. A heart transplant, right? What about a transplant? Transplant? Right? <laughs> Put it. Transplant a heart into baby girl A. Isn't that obvious? Yeah. Yes? No? Okay, the reason this wasn't done was because this case took place in 1986, in 1978. The first time a heart was ever transplanted into a newborn was in 1986. Don't forget heart transplantation only began in 1968 in a certain country, of course, we needn't, uh, needn't mention where that was. <laughs> but, um, but by 1978 or 79, no one had yet tried to transplant a heart into a baby. And therefore, by the way, you know, the first time it was done, very interesting, the first time it was done was a baby born in California with heart disease, baby was dying. The surgeon was a famous chest surgeon called Norman Shumway. He had no other option but a heart transplant, and although it had never been done, there was no other option. What's the hardest part of transplanting a heart into a newborn? They scoured the United States, and they found a baby available for be being a donor in Vermont. But Vermont is 3,000 miles away from California. But there was no other hope, so they hired a private jet in California. They put one of the young surgeons in the jet in California, flew him across the country to Vermont, he cut out the heart of the donor child in Vermont, put it into a box of cold cardioplegic solution, and they couldn't get the jet started. They couldn't get the plane going. They ended up scrambling United States Air Force supersonic fighter, put this terrified young doctor in the back of a supersonic fighter with a heart in a box in his lap. When they got back to California, they resuscitate the doctor. <laughs> but they did, and they saved the life of the baby in California, right? But back in 78, nobody had done this yet, and therefore transplant was not an option. Second option to say baby girl A, artificial heart, right? Why don't you leave the heart in baby girl B, put an artificial heart into baby girl A? <coughs> even today, we don't have a fully implantable artificial heart, not even for adults, certainly not for children, although it's very exciting research taking place, but we don't have that. Third option for baby girl A, any veterinary students here? Animal heart, right? So we use pig valves all the time in humans. But if you try to use a pig heart or a baboon heart, it's rejected in six to eight hours. We haven't conquered that technology yet, so that cannot be done. And the fourth option, of course, is cloning your own tissues, right? Growing hearts and organs from your own stem cells, which is very exciting research. But back in 1978, that was not yet, not yet on, the, on the scene. And therefore, Dr. Coop said, we have only one option. And namely, apart from letting your twins die, let me try to take the life of one to save the life of one. The parents asked their rabbi, the rabbi asked his rabbi, and the question arrived on the doorstep of Ramosha Feinstein, who was probably the greatest halachic authority in the world at the time. He was in his 80s. He later said it was the most difficult life and death decision that he was ever asked to make, and he made hundreds, if not thousands. And what I'd like to share with you is some of the analysis that he went through in order to come to a halachic uh, understanding of what should be done. Okay, question one that he asked was this. Are these two little girls two people, or are they one? Why is that relevant, that question? If these two little girls are one person, you're not killing someone, you're simply 
amputating part of a person. In Judaism, can you cut away the part of a person's body in order to save the person? Yeah. Yeah. You're obliged to, right? You're obli By the way, do you have to cut away part of your body to save another person's life? No. Give you a case. About 600 years ago, a Jew in Turkey was accused of stealing by the Sultan. What's the Muslim punishment for stealing? This Jew was sentenced to have his hand cut off. He managed to escape and he fled to Egypt. The Sultan in Turkey captured another Jew, put him in jail, and sent a message to the man in, Turkey as, in Egypt as follows. He said, if you refuse to come home, I'll kill him. Come home, I'll free him and cut your hand off. Refuse to come home, I'll kill him. You see the dilemma? So that man in Egypt went to the great Rad Bas, great Sephardi halachic authority, Rav David ben Zimri, one of the greatest, and he said to him, Rabbi, am I obliged to go home and have my hand cut off to save a life? Or may I remain here even though he will die? Do you have to give away part of your body to save a life? Amazing question, right? You should ask your local rabbis, whoever you study with, to study his answer, which is amazing. But I'll just tell you the bottom line. He says that if the man would go and give his hand to save a life, it would be an incredible mitzvah, tremendous act of kindness, allowed in Judaism, but not obliged. And this is the rationale we follow today with kidney transplantation. When we ask someone for a kidney, we say to them, we need your kidney to save your brother's life. We say, it is safe enough that Judaism allows it. It's risky enough that you don't have to do it. In other words, it's up to you. And that raises amazing stuff. I'm not going to discuss this in detail this evening, just to mention one point. Imagine you have a person dying of kidney failure and you say to his brother, would you like to give your kidney? Let's say he does not wish to give it. How can he say no with the whole family looking at him and saying, how can you refuse? How can they withstand the emotional pressure, coercive emotional pressure? He is amazing, amazing pressure. The solution to that was proposed by a rabbi many years ago and it's now used throughout the world, the non-Jewish world. And here's what they do. They test the whole family and they see who matches. They then interview the family individually and privately. When the surgeons meet with a family member who matches best, they say to them, you are alone with us in this room. You match. If you agree, we'll take your kidney and save your brother's life. If you refuse, we'll never disclose that you matched. We'll falsify the record. Your family will never know. You will have to live with the decision for the rest of your life. But no one in your family will ever know. We'll, take, we'll lie to take off from you. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes you can't do that because you need to know. For example, in the United States recently, they've been doing a thing called cross transplants. You know what that is? This is amazing. If this doesn't move you, basically, there's no hope for you. <laughs> Let's say you have a mother who wants to give a kidney to a child, but she doesn't match. They look for another mother who's prepared to give a child to her ch kidney to her, who also doesn't match. And they ask Mrs. A if she will give her kidney to little B, if Mrs. B will give her kidney to little A. And if they agree, they sign the forms and they start the operation on both mothers at exactly the same moment so neither one can change her mind. They extract their kidneys and they switch them. And a few months ago in America, they did 10. 10. Mrs. A gave a kidney to little B so that Mrs. B would give a kidney to little C. So that Mrs. C gave a kidney to little D. Isn't that amazing? 10 people got kidneys from somebody else's relative, right? That's called cross-transplantation. Anyway, that's some of what's going on. But if you say that these two little twins are two people, then you are not amputating part of a person. What are you doing? You're killing someone to save someone else. What would you say? These twins are two people or one? Most authorities who've debated this case have felt that we should judge them as two people, which makes our question much more difficult, right? Okay, here comes the second question. Stay with me carefully. Rabbi Feinstein sent the following question to Dr. Koop. He said, Doctor, you are planning to operate in such a way that you save baby girl B and kill baby girl A. Could you reverse your decision? Could you reconnect the heart so that baby girl A survives and you kill B? And Dr. Koop said, ask the aged rabbi why he wants me to perform the surgically impossible. And to his dying day, which is just a few months ago, he maintained vehemently that there's no way that he could have changed the decision. It was complicated enough like this, and there was no way that they would guarantee that B would survive anyway. And therefore he said no. When Rabbi Feinstein got that answer, he said, right, you can go ahead and operate. Now what lay behind that question? Rabbi Feinstein did not want him to say baby girl A. He was quite happy to say baby girl B, where the heart was. But what lay behind that question? So stay with, carefully with me and I'll try to explain. We have a law in Judaism called Rodef. Rodef means that if you, listen, listen well, if you see somebody trying to kill someone else, and the only way you can save the victim, or rape by the way, homosexual or heterosexual rape, but let's talk about murder, it's complicated enough. You're walking down the street, you see A trying to kill B. The only way you can save B is by killing A. What do you do? What do you do in Jewish law? Kill A. 
Allowed to or obliged to? Allowed. Obliged. Obliged. Obliged to. If there's no way to say, if you could shoot him in the foot, you're not allowed to kill him. Is that clear? But if there's only way to save the victim is by killing the aggressor, that's what you do. What's the commonest case of this law? The commonest general case of killing A to save B? In law? Self-defense. Self when B is you. If A is trying to kill you, you can preemptively kill... Is that, is that clear? In all jurisdictions you can do that. You can kill someone else to save your life preemptively, right? Question two for homework. You're walking down the street, you see A trying to kill B. And you, instead of, but you could shoot him in the foot, but you kill him instead. Is that culpable? As, are you guilty of homicide for killing him because you didn't have to, you could have injured him? And part, question two, part B, someone tries to kill you. You could shoot him in the foot, but you kill him. Are you guilty of murder because you killed him when you didn't have to, but you acted in self-defense? Do you see the question? Okay, think about that. Fascinating question for homework. But that is the question of one person trying to kill another. By the way, this does not apply when two people are trying to kill each other. If you see A trying to kill B, you can kill A to save B. If you walk out into the street and you see two people with their hands over their gun, this <coughs> happens in California all the time, doesn't it? That's a common scene in California. Um, that is a situation where you may not intervene. Each one can kill the other one to save his life, but you cannot kill one. Only if one is trying to kill another. Is this clear? Okay. So why are we studying this law of Rodef? Because maybe the babies are threatened, maybe one of them is threatening the other one. Maybe they're threatening each other. Okay, that's the law of Rodef. By the way, what's the commonest medical application of this law? When a pregnant woman, when the pregnancy threatens the life of the mother, Judaism rules that the baby is a Rodef on the mother, and therefore you can terminate the pregnancy. Only while she's pregnant. Once the head is born, or half the body is born in the world, <clears throat> then you cannot kill the child to save the mother. Then they have equal claims to life. <laughs> but while the mother is pregnant and the birth has not begun, then in Jewish law, the mother's life, life takes precedence. By the way, this was a Catholic hospital. The Catholics rule exactly the opposite. When a mother and child are fighting for survival, in Catholic law they try to save the child and let the mother die. The reason is, don't ask me questions about this. I have enough trouble keeping up with Jewish law. <laughs> but I'll tell you what the priests told me in that hospital. They told me that according to Catholic uh, uh, understanding, a child is born in a state of sin. And unless they've been baptized to be saved by the grace of Christianity, they go to a very bad place in the hereafter. The mother has already been baptized, so she's guaranteed a place in heaven. So it's better to let her die and save the child to baptize the child. My father was a doctor before me. My father came from South Africa to study medicine in England. My father told me there were times when he was attending a woman in labor in a very Catholic maternity hospital in Dublin, when the father walked over and said to him, Doctor, if my wife's labor becomes obstructed, I want you to save the baby and let my wife die. These were not cases of difficult marriages, you understand? They were cases of Catholic law. In Judaism, absolutely not. We take the life of the fetus in order to save the life of the mother. So that is the situation. But it can get very complicated. For example, in 1973 here in Israel, there was a case of some Israeli soldiers in the Sinai being fired upon by other Israelis. You know, you call this friendly fire, mistaken identity. And what happened was there was a group of Israeli soldiers in one position and they were being fired upon, rocket fire, mortar fire, by another group of Israelis who couldn't see who it was. And they could not communicate. At a distance was a third group of Israeli boys who saw what was happening and could not communicate with either group. And in this third group were some religious soldiers who knew the law of Redef. And they said, look, if A is trying to kill B and the only way you can save B is by killing A, we ought to kill them. You know, a tragic situation. They had a terrible argument about it on the battlefield, and they did not fire. In the end, people died in the first group. When these soldiers got home, they went to see Rav Yashiv, great rabbi in Jerusalem, and they said, what should we have done? He said, there's no way you'd been allowed to fire. These soldiers are doing what they ought to be doing in wartime, under genuine case of mistaken identity. Halakhically, that's called min shamaya karad filay. They are pursued from heaven. You're definitely not allowed to intervene. Question three for homework. Why is this not like the fetus? Fetus threatens the life of the mother innocently, we kill the fetus. Soldiers threaten the life of the soldiers innocently, we don't kill the soldiers. Do you see the problem? Okay, think about that, it's worth a whiskey, right? Interesting question. So those are some of the laws of Redef, right? Why are we dis debating Redef? Because maybe we could see our way clear to killing baby girl A if she's a Redef on baby girl B. And we need one final law and then we can close the circle. What happens if the Redef is one of a group? For example, we're sitting in this room and suddenly the building is surrounded by non-Jewish terrorists. And they give us an ultimatum. 
Give us one Jew to kill, the rest of you can go free. Or we kill everyone. Or one woman to rape, or we rape them all. Okay, but let's deal with murder again. Are we allowed to give a person to die? And think about it. If we don't, everyone's going to die. What's Jewish law say? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Although many people will die, that's his problem. We are not allowed to kill somebody in order to save many. However, what happens if they name the person they want? They specify the person. We want Finkelmovich. Got a problem with him. Send him out to die. The rest of you can go. What would you say? Think about it. The f in the first case, the problem is, who are we to make the selection? Why should we kill you or you or you? In the second case, Finkelmovich is a dead man anyway. Why do we all have to die? Do you see that? Okay, so the answer to that fascinating discussion in the Jerusalem Talmud, I'm not going to go into the detail, but who's a law student here? Anyone? Law students? Keep your wits about you. The Talmud says that once there was a man called Sheva bin Bichri who attacked King David. What's the Jewish punishment for attacking the Jewish king? Um, death. Absolutely, execution. But he managed to escape and he hid in the town of Avel. Yoav, David's general, surrounded the town with his army and he gave the people of the town such an ultimatum. He said, if you don't give me Sheva bin Bichri or kill him, I'll wipe you all out. What happened was a very old lady called Sarah Bas Asher climbed up on the ramparts, began debating the case halakhically with Yoav, had him killed, threw his head over the wall, and she saved the whole city. So the Talmud says, you see from this case that if the person is named, because Sheva bin Bichri was named, that's called Yichdu. If the person is named, you could kill him to save everyone. What's wrong with that proof? He wasn't only named, he was guilty. How can you prove from this case? So Talmud says there's a fascinating debate in the Talmud. One opinion is that Sheva bin Bichri was killed because he was named. The other opinion, because named and guilty. The other opinion is that he was, just happened to be guilty, but that's not necessary. And there's an argument down to this day. The Rambam rules that you cannot kill such a person. But there are great Jewish authorities. For example, the, the Rashba, Rav Shlomo ben Aderet, was the Rav of Barcelona in the 14th century. Many debate, many talk about it. Some hold that you could kill such a person, even if he's not guilty, but at least he's designated. Look at A and B. If you could kill either one, could you make such a choice? No. But when Rabbi Feinstein got the answer, there's no way to save A. The only one we can save is B. Maybe we can say that A is designated to die. She's threatening B and not the reverse. And maybe she's like the fetus threatening the mother. And possibly that's enough for us to allow, allow us to kill A in order to save B. Let me tell you what happened in the case. In fact, Rabbi Feinstein took 11 days of thinking about this together with his family. He has a son-in-law as a professor of biology. He has a grandson who's an internist in Natania, Natania Hospital. And they got together to give Rav Moshe the medical and technical input so he could he had the luxury of 11 days because the hospital was preparing surgery over time. The nurses, the Catholic nurses refused to take part even though the Catholic priest authorized surgery. And the reason was they felt emotionally unable to go into an operating room where they would see a child killed. You know, almost no one ever dies in an operating room. You can almost always get them out into recovery, you know, where it's someone else's, someone else's problem, right? To see a child killed by the surgeon, absolutely, you know, horrendous. And so the hospital had to put together a team of volunteers in the end in order to, to do the surgery. And they were unprecedented, just for the medical students, I'll share this with you. They decided to use two separate teams of anesthesiologists in the end. Can you see the problem? Two little newborn heads, each team controlling the respiratory function of their twin, and anything they did to the respiratory function of their twin remains separate, but anything they do to the circulation affects the other child as well. Because although they're separate lungs, there's one circulation. They don't teach you that at medical school, right? Not even at, U, not even at UPenn, right? And therefore, this was a completely unprecedented situation, and it took a long time to sort out, but eventually it did. Some of the questions Rabbi Feinstein, one of the young rabbis said to Rabbi Feinstein, what if two people are coming down by a parachute, and one man's parachute fails to open, so he grabs his friend's leg? But due to his weight, the parachute begins to rip. Is the man with the parachute on his back allowed to kick his friend off to a certain death? Is the, is the heart like the parachute? Another question they asked him was, imagine you have two people, two people walking through the desert. One of them has a bottle of water. There's enough water in the bottle that if he drinks it, he'll get back to civilization. Right? Why you want to do that these days beats me, but you know, if you did. But if you share the water with your friend, you'll both die. In other words, you'll both live another day or two and then both die. Is it better to share the water and both die a day later? Or to let him die today, you drink it and survive in the long term? So we rule according to Rabbi Akiva's opinion that, that the one who has the water drinks it. The one who has the water drinks it, okay? That's how we rule. Is the heart like the bottle of water? 
Question four for homework. What happens if neither one owns the water? You land there in a helicopter with a bottle of water, there's two people dying in the desert. Do you flip a coin and give it to one so that one survives? Or do you then share it so that both live a little longer? In other words, the question is, is ownership the reason that the person who has it drinks it? Is it because it's my water? Or is the logic it's better to have one person survive in the long term rather than two? But before I tell you the outcome, I must share with you an incredible incident that occurred in the courtroom. Dr. Coop insisted on a court hearing to authorize surgery. Why? Because he was concerned that under Philadelphia, under Pennsylvania law, somebody might charge him with homicide for killing baby girl A. So he wanted to be protected himself in the hospital against a charge, you understand? So he wanted, a, so a three judge panel was convened on Thanksgiving Day that year and a team of lawyers argued precedent in front of the judges to convince them that they should allow surgery. Most of the examples they gave the judges were things known as lifeboat ethics. You know, people in a lifeboat, there wasn't enough food for everyone, so they starved someone, they threw someone overboard. There have been cases where they ate someone. There's a famous case in British law where there were three men about 100 years ago in the South Atlantic shipwrecked. Three of them were left alive in a lifeboat. The, first, the captain, the first officer, and a young 19-year-old cabin boy called Robert Parker. After 17 days without food, the two older men decided to kill him and eat him. Okay, they killed him with a pocket knife and ate him raw and survived. When they got back to England, they admitted what they'd done and they were charged with murder and tried in England for murder. Look it up, it's an incredible case. It's a major precedent in British and American maritime law. That is called the case of Robert Parker, absolutely. And that is, um, that's a famous case. In the end, the judges allowed surgery and surgery went ahead. But an amazing incident occurred in the courtroom. And listen carefully to this. The lawyers at one point argued that surgery should be allowed because in Pennsylvania 1978, the definition of death was cessation of spontaneous heartbeat. When the heart stops beating, the patient has died. So they argued like this. Of course surgery should be allowed. You're going to leave the heart beating in the chest of baby girl B. If no heart stops beating, nobody's dying. Isn't that cool? Do you know what this means? If you don't like someone, hack their heart out, keep it ticking in your lab. Cut up the rest of them in small pieces. No problem. If no heart stop beating, nobody's dying. This is what you call a loophole. And in a secular democracy, when people make up the laws, they go along. You get weird things like this. In Torah, which comes from another world, you don't get this. Rabbi Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, one of the great rabbis of the last century, said a beautiful thing. He said, in a democracy, the people make the law. In Judaism, the law makes the people. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, let me tell you what happened, and I'll, and I'll finish with that. Surgery went ahead. In fact, a team of doctors opened the chests of the children, separated their livers. Dr. Coop insisted on being the one to tie off the vessels of baby girl A. Terrible, terrible moment, obviously. She died immediately. The heart continued beating, although they weren't sure that it would. He carried the body of baby girl A over to the sterile table. They never needed her ribs. They were able to get the chest of B closed with the breast tissue in the normal place and all the anatomy correctly disposed without needing ribs from baby girl A and he handed the body of baby girl A back to the family the same day so they could bury her right before sunset and people present say it was an incredible experience to see how the Jews and non-Jews went along with the halachic requirements as laid out by an elderly sage among the Jewish people and that in fact is what happened in this case. Life begins at conception but you only get what's called a yetzer ra at birth and a yetzer tov at bar mitzvah, right? So a fetus is certainly a living human being. That's why you can break Shabbos, for example, to save a pregnancy, no, no matter at which stage. Yes? So, obviously in this case, like, you couldn't ask baby A her opinion, but like in all the other yes. cases you mentioned, yes. like, let's say someone like volunteered and said, okay, like, I'll be the one that gets killed. Okay, so the answer is like this. You don't, not only volunteer, you'd have to actually do it. If a crowd of people are threatened and you ran out of the room to give your life to save many, that's an incredible act, tremendously uh, meritorious and allowed. Not obliged, of course, but allowed. But if you say, look, take me and kill me, we couldn't do that. You'd have to actually give your life to save everyone else. 1950-ish, a man was driving his car down the Carmel Mountain in Haifa. Have you been there? Very steep mountain. Yeah. The brakes failed. Actually, this was an Israeli car. Uh, never used the brakes before. <laughs> just used the horn. You know, they make cars in Israel that don't have brakes. They just give them horns. You know that? You, you notice that? Anyway, this fellow was driving down the mountain. His brakes failed. 
and he found himself careening towards a bus stop in which 10 people were standing. Listen carefully. He's about to kill 10 people. He could not stop. But he could turn, but unfortunately only to a place where one person was standing. What should he have done? Again, do nothing, wipe out 10 people. Ah, turn, kill one innocent person, one bystander, save 10. What should he have done? Okay, listen to this. I don't know what he did, but afterwards they went to ask the Chazonish, great rabbinic authority in Bnei Brak, what should the man have done? And the Chazonish says, and he writes about this, he says, I think he should have turned and killed the man. They said, Rabbi, doesn't that contradict what we learned this evening? We, listen, listen. We learned that if 10 people are about to die and you could kill one to save them, may you do that? No. No way. So how come you could kill this one to save the 10? And let me point out, they're exactly parallel situations. I'm not looking here for practical differences. They're exactly parallel. Let me make that clear. I've got 10 people in front of my car. Out of control, okay? It's not my fault. Someone sabotaged the brakes. If I do nothing, 10 people die. If I turn and kill one person, disconnected from the scene, he's standing under a tree thinking deep philosophical thoughts about uh, life and death. If I kill him, I save 10. Should I do that, said the Chazanish? Yes. Scenario number two. 10 people about to wipe out by terrorists. One guy innocently sitting under a tree thinking deep thoughts. The terrorists say, Tats, here's a high-powered rifle. Shoot that guy in the head and 10 people live. Am I allowed to shoot him? No way. Why? They're exactly the same situations. Come on, what's the difference? You're not allowed to do that. In halachic analysis, you may never introduce a doubt from the outside. We are dealing with a lab situation. All the variables are frozen, guaranteed. There are two parallel situations with all the certainties and doubts exactly the same. The same guy in both scenarios. The same innocent person standing under the tree. In the first case, I shoot him dead with a gun to save 10 people. In the second case, I run him down with my car. It's exactly the same person. In the car, I'm also not killing him. This car's out of control. No fault of mine. In both cases, if I do nothing, 10 die, and I can kill one to save 10. They're exactly the same. Here's your clue. Stay tuned. I'm going to give you two other cases that bear the same relation, but I think more clearly. Okay, here it comes. You're standing by a railway track, railroad track. Express train's coming down the line. It's going to fly past you and wipe out five people standing on the line. If you pull the points quickly, you, you cause the track to veer, the train goes down a new line where there's one person standing and he'll die. Again, you stand there, do nothing, train flies past you, kills five people. Act quickly, change the track, train goes onto a new line, kills one person. If you think you should pull the points and change the track, raise your hand. More than 90% of Westerners agree with you that you should pull the points. Scenario number two, you're a doctor in a hospital, you've got five people dying of organ failure. They need transplants desperately. The nurse walks in and says, Doctor, there's a young man in the waiting room. Come to visit his mother. Let's cut his throat, take five of his organs, and save five lives. Anything where we should do that? It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. And if you don't like blood, if you don't like blood, rig up a lever that you pull that does something that cuts his throat, take his organs, save five people. How come in the case of the train, you told me to pull the lever, kill one person to save five? In the case of the people in the hospital, you said no. They're exactly the same.